Hello, everybody. It is such an honor and a pleasure to be here sharing the work that we have underway at Oviva. I'm here to talk about new frontiers in women's health. And I'm partly excited to be on this stage because I think we've seen a lot of really exciting technologies coming, a, little, a lot of exciting information coming. But one area where I feel like we're only just seeing this, starting to see innovation is in women's health. And that's in large part because there's been a huge historical disparity in the research that's been done around female physiology. It wasn't until 2016 that the NIH, which is the largest funding body in the world for biomedical research, required the inclusion of female animals in biomedical research. And of course, I think many of us here know that it was the early 90s when female humans were required to be included in clinical trials. And as such, most of the diagnostic pathology that we, the, diagnos the diagnostics that we have in place, the pathological understanding of diseases has all been understood on a male baseline, which has really left women behind when it comes to the care that we receive, but also how we think about our health and well-being. Um, it's not just a research problem it's, a problem, it's also a funding problem, which I'm not really going to talk a whole lot about, but I think it's, you know, we know that research and science and innovation goes hand in hand with the funding that it receives. And I'm really thrilled. One of the reasons I left academia and went into biotech is because there's more money here right now to elevate this work and to do this work, and, and I'm excited to tell you how we're doing that now. So. I'm particularly interested in the ovaries. Uh, when we think about men versus women, they're one of the key organs that differentiate between us. And what's interesting about them is they actually age at about two and a half times the rate of the rest of the body. What you can see in this graph is the functional output of different organs in the body. And you can see female fertility, which is the, one of the main functions of the ovary, really declines at what is now midlife, whereas the rest of the organs continue and more gradually decline later in life. And this puts women at a distinct disadvantage, not only because because their ovaries decline and they decline in fertility, but there's a whole system that's supported by your ovaries. Every aspect of your health and well-being is intimately linked with our ovarian health. And that's one thing that I want to leave you with today is the importance of ovarian health for our overall health and well-being. Now, assuming most of you aren't reproductive endocrinologists or experts in ovarian biology, I'll give you a brief primer just so you can understand the lay of the land, what we're talking about here. Um, that egg-shaped organ on the left-hand side, that's the ovary. And directly adjacent to it is a schematic of what's called the ovarian reserve, or the number of eggs that a woman has at any given point in her body. Um, that's comprised of structures called the follicle, which are depicted in orange, and inside every follicle is a single egg. And once a woman hits her reproductive years, she loses is about a thousand of these every month. They enter that maturation cycle you see on the screen, ultimately leading to one dominant ovulatory follicle that releases an egg that may or may not get fertilized. So 1,000 eggs per month are getting lost while one may or may not get fertilized. And this is a huge degree of attrition that just happens with regularity throughout our lives. So interestingly, when we look at this graphically of how many eggs a woman has at any given point in time, this peaks in utero at 20 weeks gestation for a female fetus before declining to a million at birth and reaching 300,000 by the time we actually hit puberty. And what I'm particularly interested in is that graph, the, the line between puberty and menopause, because we know we have that steady decline of 1,000 eggs per month, but if we intervene on that and flatten that curve, we can actually fundamentally change the way that the ovaries decline and that women age. So with that, um, I took that idea and started Oviva Therapeutics. It was really this idea that came out of the fact that as a scientist in the field of aging, I never heard anybody talk about ovaries, and yet they're significantly and intimately linked with our health and well-being. We started Oviva with this idea that we wanted to address the unmet need in women's health, but really focus on this hypothesis that that decline in ovarian reserve is a core driver of the decline in ovarian function. And if we can intervene there, we can improve health span in women. And this is interesting and important because we know that the hormonal changes that occur with ovarian decline accelerate aging in the rest of a woman's body by roughly 6%. Those are data from Steve Horvath's lab at UCLA. And of course, we also have a lot of data around the different incidences of disease with this change that happened for women at midlife and very dramatically. There's significant increased risk is, risks of cardiovascular health, declines in neurocognitive health, problems with sleep, immune dysfunction, sexual dysfunction, um, obviously osteoporosis becomes an issue, and all of these things happen in a very dramatic short period of time that really disrupt not only quality of life but longevity as well. We know women who go through menopause later tend to live longer. 
Also, women who go through menopause earlier tend to have shorter lifespans. And when you take young ovaries and put them into older animals, this actually extends their lifespan between 6 and 11%. So there's something there, there with the youth and function of the ovaries and the overall health, well-being, and longevity of the animal that those ovaries are in. Um, some of you may have seen this paper that came out last month. I just thought I'd throw it in here because I think naked mole rats are really cool. They're one of the main animals studied for longevity because they have exceptionally long longevity. And it was found that they also have what's called eternal fertility. So they have a lot of their oocyte, um, oogenesis um, postnatally, so after they've already been born. And there's lots to be learned from organisms like this that we can then use to inform innovation and engineering to make our lives better, to improve our health span, and perhaps also to improve our longevity. So the way that we aim to do this is using a naturally occurring hormone called anti-malarian hormone. I'm showing on screen a schematic of the different reproductive hormones that are um, at play when we think about follicular genesis and reproductive endocrine system. AMH, you see on the left-hand side, is produced by the early maturing follicles. And there's been no therapeutic development to date around this because it's an incredibly complex molecule that I won't get into detail about, but I'd be happy to chat about at the break with anybody. Um, there have been many pharmaceutical companies that have tried because it's really interesting. It's the first intervention you can make on the ovarian reserve. It regulates how many, how often and how many eggs are activating out of that ovarian reserve to enter that maturation pathway. So you think about FSH and LH and the other reproductive hormones and estrogen and progesterone and things that we use commonly in birth control pills and fertility medication. There's been a lot of development there, but we really haven't touched AMH. And this is that earliest intervention point that if we could do something there, not only could we have innovative contraceptives, but we could potentially regulate the pace at which we deplete our ovarian reserve. Now, what we're doing at Oviva is using this in a proof of concept trial to assist women who are poor responders to in vitro fertilization. That might feel a little bit counterintuitive because ultimately we want to slow the release of eggs. But what happens is when you treat with this recombinant version of AMH, you actually pause the ovarian reserve and synchronize the follicles that are ready to then activate out and mature. So that when you do the standard um, stimulation protocol via IVF, you have a greater than usual cohort of follicles and eggs that are able to be matured, stimulated, and ultimately harvested. Now, preclinically, we have a lot of evidence around how successful this can be using a pretreatment or a neoadjuvant treatment to IVF in rodents. Um, in this particular experiment, which is published, the paper citation is there, and again, I'd be happy to send around after. You get 3.4x improvement in the number of eggs harvested uh, from rodents undergoing an IVF cycle. Now, this is much more interesting for women who have diminished ovarian reserve or premature ovarian insufficiency or have some sort of issue with their fertility. And in trying to recapitulate that, we, we used rodent models of that as well, and we found that you could actually double the number of ovulated eggs that you can capture with, with this method, importantly, with no negative impact on viability. And actually, there are independent groups that have replicated this result, showing that there is an increase in quality in, in their hands, which you know we wouldn't put on our label, but I think it's important to think about when we're doing anything with reproductive health, how is that actually impacting the eggs themselves. So we're at neutral or positive, which I think is really exciting. And I think of this really as a part of the path on the stepping stone to what's coming. When you're doing anything with ovarian function, it's intimately linked not only to fertility, but also to menopause. I wouldn't claim that we're a fertility company any more than I would claim we're a menopause company. We're really looking to extend the function of the ovary to support the health span of women and give them agency at later in their life, much like we got agency when we had the birth control pill. We get to choose when and how we have children for the most part. And you know those, those rights are at risk now. And I think what we're looking to develop is another toolkit or armatorium that allows us to have agency over that phase of our life when we, instead of inevitably going into menopause, might be able to choose when or how we do so. And in having this vision, Right now, we're at the early phase of this, which is validating. Um, there's so much data that we don't know. There's so much basic biology that we don't know. And it's really difficult to learn a lot of this information because rodents, of course, are not humans. They have a five to seven day estrus cycle, whereas women have a 28 to 35 day cycle. So a lot of this is validation in primates and organisms that cl more closely mirror human biology. And then, of course, going into women with this proof of concept to show that we actually can modulate the ovarian reserve in the way that we think we do and that it's safe and it's 
effective. And then building upon that, going into more chronic indications where we can show over time that not only is this mechanism consistent and conserved, which is what we believe to be true, um, but that it's also safe. And ultimately, at the end of this road, again, giving women a choice as they go through their lives of when and how to have that physiologic change happen or at least make it more gradual. Instead of it being an inevitabil in inevitability that we all just have to face at some time and we don't really know when, and there's about a 10-year period of strange nonlinear symptoms that really change things and doctors aren't even well trained to deal with that. So ultimately, what we're trying to do is learn more, raise awareness about it so people can understand their physiology better, uncover some of these unanswered questions, again, so we can understand our physiology better, train doctors better so they know how to interface with patients, but ultimately give women choice at a time when I think our choices are, have been more at risk than they've been any time in the last few decades. So with that, um, you can learn more on our website, and I'd love to talk more about it. My email's on there, and I'll be around for the next couple of days. So thank you so much for listening, and um, enjoy the rest of the sessions. Thanks, Daisy. Amazing work. So if you were going to go to look at the, the next, yeah. uh, women's health is sort of bubbling up now as a field. Yes. I don't remember having much in the way of education aside from an ob rotation in medical school. <laughs> so what do you see, what's needed from this community to help catalyze this going forward? Yeah, you know, I think you bring up a good point, which I think education is such a huge piece of it. I'm sure everyone in this room, you vaguely remember sex ed or, health or learning about puberty in grade school, but there's no other touch point in our lives where we learn about fertility or where we learn about menopause. So I think it's just the education and awareness is a huge, huge piece of it. But I think, as you said, this this is a topic that's bubbling up. There's a lot of funding coming in. There's a lot of innovation. There's some other really cool companies that are starting to crop up in this space, both digital health and cell biology. Gamito is another very cool one that's doing reprogramming to recapitulate ovarian physiology, I think, from like an implant um, perspective. So what I imagine in the next 10 plus years is that we're going to learn a lot more just about our basic health so that women have the tools. And also from the precision medicine standpoint, we have the biomarkers to better understand what's happening in our bodies because reproductive health for women is one of the most robust multivariate signatures of our health and well-being. When your cycle is off, there's a lot more going off in your body. So I think it's going to be data and information and education and awareness. Great. Watch so. the space. Thank Thanks, you. Thanks, Daisy.